All right. Holy, holy, holy. What a great word for us today, and that's so true. You know, there's so many things going on, not only in our country, but the world around us that are so prophetic. And the Lord has told us uh, thousands of years ago that this is the way it would be. And we're getting to see the evidence of that. And there are many things that we have no control over, nothing we can do about. So we have to, we have to hear the Lord and worship Him, and He protects us from our enemies. I mean, if He doesn't, we're goners for sure, is all it boils down to. And we all trust the blessings of the Lord. We all pray for the blessings of the Lord. We all desire the blessings of the Lord, and we all need the blessings of the Lord. Well, how do you get those blessings? I mean, how do you, how do you, how do you put yourself in a position to receive those blessings? Because as we all know, the Lord is in charge of everything in that nature. Our giftings, the Holy Spirit's work, our blessings, and all of those things are in God's purview of life. But in the scripture, uh, he shares with us some truths about uh, certain areas of our life that if we will line up with these truths, that we will make ourselves at least available to the blessings of God. It doesn't mean that we strong arm him or that we can force God to do anything. Obviously can't do that. But if we align with his truth, at least we get in the room with him. If we don't align with his truth, though we might pray for lots of stuff and desire lots of stuff and need, and I'm talking about not just financial things, I'm talking about all, anything in life, strength, wisdom, grace, knowledge, you know, endurance, patience, love, whatever we need, this is, God, this is God's purview. And he says, if you will obey these truths, I, you, you put yourself in a position to be able to receive these things. If you don't obey this truth, you're not even in the room. So you, you're, not getting, you're not getting it because you, you can beg and cry all you want. No, you're not even in the room. So we want to be in the room. And I shared with you last week of the 26 parables that Jesus shared while he walked on this earth. That, and a lot of them are amazing. We're, all of them are amazing in their own right, and you know that. They're just, their stories laid aside truth so we can see the truth. And uh, you know, they're just tremendous uh, uh, messages in every single one of them. But the one, one parable that I, to me, contains so much truth in such a very short time parable that it, I just wanted to share this with you because I want you to know this. And I, you need to know this. This is what, this is what you, 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 seek it at, you seek after. This is, this, is where, uh, this is where the rubber meets the road uh, in, in, in the blessings of God that we so greatly need and pray for. And, 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 don't, and I'm, I'm going to say it quite often, or I, I think, during this message. Don't simply think about money because so many times when you hear things about God's blessings, your mind goes cha-ching, you know. I mean, you just start thinking automatically about, okay, how am I going to get some money? And you've been manipulated so many times, and I have been too. I've heard so many messages about this truth that I'm going to be preaching about today, one of the greatest truths in the Bible, and it is absolutely the Word of God. It's taught many places in the Bible. It's very clear and easy to understand, but it has been used more than any other truth, in my opinion, to manipulate people and con people and deceive people than any of the other truths of the Bible. And maybe it's just, maybe the reason I feel that way is because I've been pastoring for 45 years and I've been in lots of meetings. You know, I probably, I don't know how many times more meetings than you have been in, but I, I guarantee you I have been in multiple times more meetings and revivals and stuff like that than probably any, any of you guys have been in. So I've seen it way, way more often, and it just burns me up when people do it. But let me get to it. Let me, let me get started. All right. Um, five, I uh, shared, started last week, five truths from the parable of the talents. This is the parable of the talents. It's shared in Matthew 25. 
Um, and here it goes in verse 14. This is Jesus speaking. For the kingdom of heaven is like a man traveling to a far country who called his own servants and delivered his goods to them. So there's the truth of ownership that I shared last week. It's about a, a good man, a rich man, a master, a lord he's called, who takes his goods and gives them to other men in order for them to manage and administrate and administer and so forth and to be good stewards over. So that is the truth of ownership, which just simply says to us, you must understand that God owns everything and that you own nothing. Now, we think we own something because we're Americans, after all, and we think we own what we've paid for. But the fact is, if you owned it, it would go with you when you are not here anymore. But the fact is, your stuff doesn't go with you. It stays here and somebody else has it. Somebody else will be living in my house one day that I've paid all those mortgages on and own. But I don't own it because it doesn't go with me. My hearse does not have a U-Haul and my pants won't have any po anything in the pockets. Uh, so it, the point is, when we make decisions about the resources of our life, we need to talk to the owner before we do anything with it and get his permission before we do anything with his property. So there's the, the ownership. And he gave one five talents. And then in, in the rest of the verse 15, to each according to his own ability. And immediately he went on his journey. The second truth there is the truth of dominion. To have dominion just means to rule or to dominate something. Every single one of us have been given an area of life to dominate by God. We have been given a dominion. Uh, and, and what we pray for all the time, we just say it in another way, is we pray for God to reveal the dominion that he has given us so that we can accomplish why he put us here. We pray for the will of God. The will of God is just simply another way of saying, God, what area have you given me dominion over? Tristan may, as an example, I mean, he's in the car business. Uh, his dominion most likely are cars, automobiles. Uh, I told you about the Kathy Camp uh, family that runs Chick-fil-A. They pray for their dominion. They saw a chicken, you know? I mean, it's like, oh God, a chicken, what? Well, they feel that their dominion is chicken. They, they've been given that domain in life. And so that's the will of God for them. So anyway, there it is. They gave according to their ability. He did not give them their ability. He gave them according to their ability, what they had already demonstrated they were capable of handling. He gave one five, one two, and one one because of their demonstrated capacity to handle. God does the same thing. He gives us what we can handle. So God's always watching for us to demonstrate our capacity. And he'll give us what we can handle and he won't give us more than we can handle. All right, here we go. Verse 16, I'm talking too long about this. Then he who had received the five talents went and traded with them and made another five talents and likewise, he who received two gained two more also. And he who had received one went and dug in the ground and hid his Lord's money. After a long time, the Lord of those servants came and settled accounts with them. So he who had received five talents came and brought five other talents saying, Lord, you delivered to me five talents. Look, I've gained five more talents besides them. His Lord said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful over a few things and I'll make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. He also had received two talents, came and said, Lord, you delivered to me two talents. Look, I've gained two more talents besides them. His Lord said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. Then he who had received the one talent came and said, Lord, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. And I was afraid and went and hid your talent in the ground. Look, there you have what is yours. This is the truth of use. 
God never gives us something to bury. He gives us things to use. And he will not give us more until we use what he has already given us. The one that used five got five more. The one that used two got two more. The one that used none not only didn't get anything, he's gonna get his, what he had taken away from him. This is the, the truth of use. You must use what God puts in your dominion before God puts anything else in that dominion. Number four, truth number four. Let me read verse 26. But his Lord answered and said to him, you wicked and lazy servant, you knew that I reap where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed. So you ought to have deposited my money with the bankers and at my coming, I would have received my, uh, back my own with interest. So take the talent from him and give it to the one who has 10 talents. Now, I'm, I'm labeling this as part of the, of the truth of faith, but here's the truth of faith. Everything God does is by faith. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. He that comes to God must believe that he is, what? Is present, is active, is involved, is watching you, is dealing with you personally. You must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. So if everything's done by faith, what this parable illustrates is that two of these uh, guys, the one who received five and the one who received two, looked at their master by faith they said, he's a good man. He's given us a good talent. He wants us to do good things with this. And if we do good things, he will reward us for doing good things. The one guy that hid it looked at God, at his Lord, and said, he's a hard man. He's a bad man. He expects things that he shouldn't expect. And I'm afraid of him. And so I'm going to hide this thing so I don't lose it. So he did not look at his master with faith and trust. He looked at his master with mistrust. And you can never deal with God in mistrust. You must believe. You must put confidence, put faith in him. So there are four of the great truths that put us in the room to be given the blessings of God and for God to, to work dominate, dominate, dominatingly, <laughs> I'll get it out, in your life. Now, let me give you the last truth, and it is the truth of sowing and reaping. Uh, this truth, as I said, is, I'm serious, it's one of the greatest truths in the whole word of God. It affects every area of your life. I know this thing has been taught so many times and people get up and, they, and, they, and they're gonna take an offering and they, and they convince the saints that if they give a bunch of money that God's gonna give them back a thousand fold or multiple fold and they can, you know, uh, and then they take an offering. So they manipulate you. They, that's what I call, uh, and you'll see the passage in a moment, giving of necessity. And, and Paul says, don't give, don't give of necessity. And necessity could be not only their necessity, but your necessity. And I, I would get into that psychological mumbo jumbo, but, and I might, but let me go on because I need to move. But, ver and you see this, this truth in two verses in this parable because they both say the same thing. Verse 21 and 23 both say the same thing. It just happens one was said to the guy with five talents and one was said to the guy with two talents and here's what, it, what the Lord said to both of them. His Lord said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. In other words, because you have been faithful over a small group of things, I'm going to give you a big group of things. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to expand what you, what, what you have. So let me explain what I'm talking about here. This is the law of sowing and reaping. Now, I don't remember how long ago I heard this outline, and this is not the outline for today's message, by the way, but it's the outline I have always used when I'm preaching about sowing and reaping. And I heard it so long ago, I've been in the ministry 45 years, I, I, I went to church five or six years before I went into the ministry, so it, I don't even know when I heard it. And I don't know who I heard it from, but here's the outline. 
When you're talking about sowing and reaping, you're talking about you reap what you sow, you reap more than you sow. If you sow corn, you're gonna get corn, right? You're not gonna sow corn and get cotton. You sow corn and get corn, reap what you sow. You reap more than you sow. If you, you, don't, if you sow one butter bean, you don't get one butter bean back. You get a bunch of butter beans, right? All right, and you reap later than you sow because you don't go out and plant a seed today and go out tomorrow and pick the fruit off of it. It has a gestation period, so you reap later than you sow. So there's your simple outline for sowing and reaping. Uh, if, you, if you want to preach a sermon on it one day, you reap what you sow, you reap more than you sow, and you reap later than you sow. Now, this law began in Genesis chapter one. Like almost everything else in life, it began in the book of Genesis, and it's in the very first chapter. Right after God created Adam and Eve, uh, before he goes back in chapter two and gives us some details about certain things, just in the general creation, as soon as he created Adam and Eve, here's what he said to them in Genesis chapter one, verse 28 and 29. Then God blessed them and God said to them. Now he's gonna give them two commandments in these verses that are still true for us today. These are still commandments to all of us today. The first one, God said to them, be fruitful and multiply. Now, in the Old Testament, that command was predominantly, predominantly a command concerning having babies. In the New Testament, Jesus comes along and Jesus expands the concept of that being fruitful and multiplying from simply a physical concept of, of, of developing a human race on this earth to the concept of something much broader than just having babies. And here's where he said it in Matthew 28, verse 19. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And he goes on in verse 20 to complete that and talk about in low to the ends of the age. You know, this is the great commission. That's what we call it. This is where Jesus says, your mission in life is this. And if you'll notice what it is, our commandment is to go spiritually and make spiritual disciples of all nations so that we are not the only people to go to heaven. So fill the earth, subdue it, the verse says, have dominion over it over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing on the earth. So the second command now is to take dominion over your area of life. Be fruitful and multiply spiritually. Be a witness. Uh, bring people into the kingdom with you as much as possible. Be a great influence and try to win them to faith in Christ so that we all go to heaven together. We have a big harvest and we all go to heaven together. And then take dominion over an area of life. He said over the birds, the air, fish, and sea, over everything that creeps on the earth. Subdue it, subdue it and have dominion over it. We all have an area of dominion. Talon has one. I have one. Tanya has one. Tristan has one. Justin, Holly, you know, Rick has one. We, uh, Brian, we, we all have areas of dominion. And he says, I command you to take dominion over your area of life. And so we then say, all right, Lord, how would we do that? If you've given us an area of dominion, how are we gonna take dominion over it? Tristan sees automobiles in his vision of his dominion. Well, how is he going to get automobiles? How is he going to deal with automobiles? What's he going to do with automobiles? How is he going to get enough money to deal with automobiles? Now, God tells us how we're going to do it in this next verse. This verse 28 was, do it. Be fruitful, multiply, take dominion. Here's how you do it. Notice the very next verse. And God said, see, I have given you every herb that yields seed, which is on the face of the earth, and every tree whose fruit yields seed, it shall be food for you. So here's the commandment. Completely fill this earth with people, and here's your seed. Completely fill the earth with vegetation 
that will feed all of these people on earth. What I'm trying to say to you is that, that everything starts with the seed in the garden. I have given you dominion, but you're going to have to use the seed to gain dominion over your area of life. I'm telling you that you have everything you need in your garden of life, no matter how small you think it is. And the reason why is because God has given you seed. You, look, you are sitting here today because of a seed. You were a seed one day. Now you are sitting here because of a seed. I am going to go home after church and eat part of a cow. <laughs> that cow was a seed. That's why it's available to me. Pat's going to make some spinach casserole. I mean, uh, broccoli casserole. Justin's going to make some green beans, vegetable stuff. I, I know somebody's bringing some corn. Pat's bringing some corn. We don't eat without corn, but anyway. But anyway, but all of those vegetables were seeds. The bread that we eat was at one time a seed. The fruit that we eat was a seed. Every living thing that we consume in order to give us life comes from a seed. And if you sow and reap, God is saying, if you sow and reap, you can do everything I called you to do because of the truth of a seed. Let me show you the Apostle Paul talking about it. The Apostle Paul gives two verses in two completely different books talking about the seed in two different contexts. All right, the first context we're going to look at is the Apostle Paul talking about the seed as being universal. In other words, the seed can be anything. He's not talking about money. Money's included, but he's not just talking about money, but he's talking about everything in life. Everything we do, everything we say, everything we ex exhibit in life is a seed that God gives us to plant. And if we plant it properly, and we plant, it, plant good things, we have good results. I mean, really, seriously, this, this, is, this affects every area of your life, and nothing is excluded from this area of life. Here it is, Galatians 6, verse 7, 8, and 9. Let me read it with you. For he starts off in verse 7. Do not be deceived. What's the first question you're going to ask? About what? Right? He says, do not be deceived. Well, what am I going to be deceived about? He says, I, I don't want you to be deceived about what he's about to say, which is sowing and the truth of sowing and reaping. So what he's saying is, look, I don't want you to be deceived about the truth of sowing and reaping. God is not mocked. Look at the next. For whatever a man sows, whatever it is, Everything in life, whatever you sow, that shall he also reap. For he who sows to the flesh, who sows bad seed of the flesh, reaps rotten stuff, corruption. But he who sows to the Spirit, everybody say good seed, shall, uh, shall of the Spirit reap everlasting life shall reap good stuff. Verse nine, and let us not grow weary while doing good, for in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. Say, if we don't give up. That's what it means. That's what losing heart means. I'm gonna reap if I don't give up. I'm, I'm gonna reap. So do not be deceived if you don't believe this truth of sowing and reaping, you are, are, you are living in the state of deception. You are being deceived. God is not mocked. 
Mot is the Greek word mukterizo. Your mukter in the Greek language is your nose. Mukterizo means don't turn up your nose to God. You can't turn your nose up to God. God's not putting up with that mess. So Paul is saying, don't get these lies in your head and throw up your nose to God believing that this doesn't work. It does work. Everything you sow in this life, you are going to reap it back 100% of the time. If you sow good seed, you will reap right stuff, righteousness. If you sow sin seeds, hate seeds, greed seeds, misery seeds, seductive seeds, you're going to reap those same qualities back in life 100% of the time. You can sow bad seed if you want to. Go ahead and sow all of the anger, hostility, unforgiveness, and sow all of that stuff. But just know this, you're going to reap that same stuff back again. Don't be deceived about that, he says. You know why? Because sin has a harvest. If it wasn't for the, well, sin, let, let's just begin it this way. Sin is fun, right? Can we admit that? Sin is fun. You know why I say that? Because if it wasn't fun, we wouldn't do it. Because God has to command us not to do it. If it wasn't fun, he wouldn't have to command us not to do it. We wish we wouldn't be doing it. But it is fun. It's exciting. It's alluring. It's tantalizing. Our flesh loves to sin. The only problem with it is the harvest. The harvest is the stinking pits. What is the harvest of sin? Well, Paul says in Romans 6, for the wages of sin is death. Whoa, that's a bad harvest. That's a heavy consequence harvest. So sin would be great if it just wasn't for the, the consequences of it, the harvest. And, and Paul is saying, if you don't believe that, you are deceived. Don't be deceived, he said. Let me tell you the truth about this. Now, in verse 9, he says the funny couple of little things. Uh, so don't grow weary in doing good, for in due season you will reap if you don't give up. Why does Paul say that? Well, because every seed has a gestation period. And the gestation period is, is different on all the seeds. Like, if you plant, go home plant a grass seed, and I'm talking about the lawn now, not the plant. You go home. <laughs> Isn't it terrible that we have to quantify that nowadays? <laughs> We're talking about the yard now. If you go home plant a grass seed, man, a lot of different grass seeds will come up in three or four days. It takes nine months for the human seed to develop. The longest developing seed of a mammal is an elephant. It takes 18 to 22 months for that, that big joker to develop. So all seed have different gestation periods. The only thing they all have in common is they all bear fruit. Every seed bears fruit fruit, every seed has a return on it. It may be 20 years, it may be 15 years, it may be three days, it might be three hours, it might be three minutes, or it might be immediate. Some seeds have an immediate return. If you don't believe it, just go home after church today, walk up to your spouse and say, um, are you gaining weight? <laughs> that will bring some immediate harvest to you. Or is that a wrinkle I'm seeing in the corner of your eye? <laughs> there are some seeds that bring immediate. So he says, all right, uh, in due season, you need to know that you, there's a gestation period, so you're going to have to wait till the due season. And then he says, at the start of it, don't grow weary in well-doing. Oh, that's the old King James. Don't grow weary in doing good. Why does he say that? Because he knows that somebody will hear the truth about about sowing and reaping, and they'll begin to do it for a day or two. And because they don't see any results in a day or two, they'll conclude this thing doesn't work, and they'll quit. So Paul says, look, don't get tired of doing good things. 
Because if you will keep doing them in a certain period of time, they're going to bring forth something real good for you if you just won't quit doing them. You keep doing them until they bear fruit. And you can't allow yourself to get discouraged. Believe me, I, I've been a pastor for 45 years. I can tell you a little bit about discouragement. I've pastored eight churches over those 45 years. And I can tell you that I have faced church members that were obviously upset with their leadership. I mean, man, they were aggravating, annoying, hard to live with. I mean, it was obvious they didn't like me or the horse I rode in on. And they wanted me to know it. And they did everything they could to get me run off from where I was. Multiple places now. I'm not talking about one, one little place. So there were many times that I faced tremendous discouragement because of these people until the Lord helped me realize you know, I didn't sow that seed of anger. I didn't sow that seed of mistrust in them. I didn't sow that discouragement in them, that frustration in them. So the Lord helped me realize that I wasn't eating my crop. I was eating someone else's crop. I was eating the crop that someone else sowed. It was someone that came before me that sowed discouragement into them, frustration into them, anger into them, hostility into them. And so it wasn't my seed I was eating. I was obviously eating someone else's seed. So what did God help me realize that I believe will help you too? I believe that if you find yourself in this position, where you're, you're harvesting a crop of anger, hostility, uh, bitterness, strife, division, whatever it might be, from your, from your family or your church or your business or, or your friends or any, anything else in life, here's what, here's what we need to do. You need to keep planting good seed. And one of these days, you're gonna wake up to a good harvest. Now listen, you keep loving the people who are not loving you. You keep speaking kindly to people who are not speaking kindly to you or about you. You keep being a good, faithful, loyal, positive part of the team. You keep planting good seed and before you know it, that bad harvest will be gone and you will be eating the good fruit of a good harvest. Yeah, are we hearing this? Some of you may feel discouraged because you inherited poverty or you inherited chaos or you inherited conflict or some other terrible thing that you don't like. What's happening is you're eating the seed of generations that have come before you. They put you in this position by planting seeds that when this crop came up, they were gone, but you were still there. And you are eating the crop that generations before you have set into motion that are causing you to have a bad harvest. Or people around you that cast bad seeds and you're eating a rotten harvest because the people that are involved in your life are planting bad seeds, and you're getting damaged by the seeds they plant. Look, don't hang around people that plant bad seed. Get people in your life that plant good seed, positive seed, forward seed, unless you want to keep eating rotten, <laughs> rotten harvest. So what do you do? You hold your head up high, you plant good seed, and what'll happen is that, ba that that bad harvest will drop off. That thing that others did uh, before you that caused you to walk into a bad harvest, regardless of what people say, regardless of what they do, you keep planting good seed and this rotten crop will die out and you'll get a harvest of righteousness. You'll get a good harvest. Don't, if you don't give up. If you don't give up. Let me give you a paraphrase. Last week I put a paraphrase up on the screen 
from the Message Bible. I paraphrased the verse that had about three question marks in it. <laughs> and I said, let me show you what that means. Let me give you a paraphrase. All right, let me give you a paraphrase of Galatians 6, uh, 7 through 9. Don't be deceived. Whatever you sow, that is what you're going to reap. Don't get disappointed and give up because in due season, every seed has a gestation period. If you sow that seed, you're going to reap it back. 20 years from now, you may get that bread that you cast on the water or you may get it back this afternoon if you don't give up. So the context of Galatians 6 is the seed is anything that you plant in life. All right, and I'm gonna go, I, I don't wanna just say this last one for forever, so let me go on. Are y'all okay with this? Okay, all right. So now let's look at the context in 2 Corinthians 9 where the Apostle Paul says that the seed is something financial or it's a possession that you have, it's some property. And the only reason I say this, it really expands into meaning anything just like the other did. But he, he start, he, the reason he says this is because he's talking to the church in Jerusalem. The saints at Jerusalem, the Apostle Paul has gone to, to, to Corinth to take up an offering for the saints at Jerusalem. They're having a bad time. So the Apostle Paul is talking to the saints at Corinth about giving a good, a good, a good offering because the, the, the Christians in Jerusalem really need a lot of help. So he says, now I want you to give extravagantly. I want you to give, I want you to give abundantly. So that's where this comes from while he's talking to them about that. Here are the words he says to them. 2 Corinthians 9, verse six through eight. But this I say, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And he who sows bountifully will reap bountifully. So let each one give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. So the implication is that your money is not a dead instrument. That when you give your money, it's, just, it's not some dead thing that just goes out away from you and, it, and, it, and, it, and you lose it. it just, there's nothing that happens with it. Paul says, your financial gift is, is a seed and, and when you give it, you sow that seed into whatever you give it to. You need to make sure it's good ground now. I mean, that's, that's the key. I, I wish I had time to preach on that. I may do it one day. Verse eight, and God is able, look, you sow, God loves a cheerful giver. All right, now look at what he promises. And God is able to make all grace abound to you. We've talked about all grace, right? What is all grace? All grace is all the kinds of grace you need. Uh, financial grace, physical grace, spiritual grace, uh, truth grace, wisdom grace, uh, uh, health grace, all grace. And God is able to make all grace. All right, if you're a cheerful giver, and you give not grudgingly or of necessity, and it means somebody's conned you out of it, somebody's begged you, somebody said, oh, I need to give me an offering. Or you're so full of pride or so low self-esteem that you need to be acknowledged by other people and you give an offering because you want other people to see it and pat you on the back and feel good about you. That's, that's your necessity. So if you give like that, you ain't getting anything. Well, that's bad grammar, but you know what I'm saying. But if you give properly and you're cheerful about it, which just means that's your manner of life. That just means that's just the way you are. I am just a generous person. I mean, I, my, my attitude in life is, is be generous like God's generous. Don't be stingy and, and all of that. So that's a cheerful giver. And he says, if you do that, God is able to make all grace abound to you that you always having all sufficiency in financial things. No, I misread it, right? In all things, not just money things, but all things may have an abundance for every good work. What in the world does that mean? It means 
Some people who sow this cheerful seed of money, they don't need money back from God. But they do have something they need. They have, they, they, they have, a, they have a child that has, that has run away from home. Or they have a cousin who's lost and doesn't know Christ. Or they have a friend or a neighbor or their loved one in the hospital with some terrible disease and sickness in their body or they have some kind of issue in their family or issue in their marriage. This verse is saying, when you give to the Lord, you can look for the harvest in whatever place you have need. So when you give money, it doesn't just come back as money. Believe it or not, there's some people that are so financially blessed, they don't need money back. They have all the money they need, but they do have something that they need. And though, and though many times the monetary sowing of a seed does come back as money, and that's okay, that's good news, right? Obviously, we don't give in order to get stuff back. That's preached a lot of time. You give and got a bit back a hundredfold. Yeah, that's, and that's the sales pitch. You give $100, he'll give you back, you know, 100000 or whatever it is. Yeah, you're giving because you want to get back. We don't give because we want to get back. If you do, you ain't getting it, I'm telling you. You give because of a thankful heart, because of a heart that recognizes that if it wasn't for him, you wouldn't have anything. And because you want to be obedient to what he said. But here's the truth. Every time we give, it comes back to us. Why? Because God wants to bless us and give us more to be a blessing with. We give. Our attitude is, I'm a generous person. God has given to me. And I'm looking for God's direction about where I should invest this. And I give, and then I give, and then he gives back to me. And then I have now more to give, and I give more, and then he gives back to me. And then I have more to give, and it just happens over and over and over ultimately to the point that we get more blessed and the kingdom of God grows and that's why God wants us to know the truth about this. That's why he doesn't want us to be deceived about this because that is the truth that he has put in his word to let us know how to have dominion over the areas of life that he has given us to have dominion. And that is the one thing that we would be prospered by and the devil would hate the worst is if we actually found God's purpose for our life. And it comes through sowing the seed of everything your personality, your nature, your kindness, your generosity, your loyalty, everything is a seed. And you're going to reap back what you sow. Let me give you life lessons from farmers. All right, quickly. I'm smart farmers. <laughs> Brian's laughing. He's been here a long time. Life lessons from smart farmers. Here we go. Farmers are the most practical people on the earth. They have to be because they deal constantly with what insurance companies call acts of God. What is an act of God? Lightning striking somebody, a tornado hitting, a hurricane hitting, a flood, uh, whatever disaster it is, is, that's an act of God. It's funny, they never identify anything good as an act of God, only things that are terrible as an act of God. Well, farmers deal with acts of God and they deal with the laws of nature, which the laws of nature are very fixed and very firm and no matter what the religion of global warming has to say about anything, um, they're, they're immutable. They don't, you ain't changing them. And they have to deal with them all the time. Hey, no farmer needs to be a gambler. He gambles every time, every season. He puts his seed in the ground hoping it'll be enough rain and enough heat and all and the bugs will stay off of it and he can get his crop in and he can sell it. And blah, blah. I mean, oh my goodness, I can't even imagine that. But anyway, uh, here's what smart farmers understand. Three things. Number one, don't eat all your seed. I know that should go without saying, but if a farmer eats all of his seed, he ain't gonna have a crop next year. He ain't got nothing to plant, right? <laughs> Your future is not in your stomach. Your future is not in your bank account. I have to plant seeds in order to have a crop. It's amazing how many people eat all their seed. They don't have any seed. 
They spend every dime they make. They spend more dimes than they make. They are, they are, they are mortgaged to the hilt on everything in life. They couldn't give if they wanted to because they don't have any seed to give. They've eaten all their seeds. That's what happens when we, when we want everything our beady little eyes see in life. And it's amazing how many people spend every dime they make. Well, farmers understand that when you eat all of your seed or you leave it in the barn, there's not gonna be any reaping next year and you're gonna starve to death because you don't have anything to sow that'll bring forth a crop. So you gotta sow it in good ground. That's why we give our first 10% to the Lord because he's good ground and, and it acknowledges him. But anyway, let me go on. Uh, number two, second thing, plant what you wanna harvest. Could it be any simpler than that? Plant what you want to harvest. Can you imagine a farmer standing out in his field just frustrated and angry saying, what's all this corn doing here? I, I, have, a, I have a whole section of corn, nothing but corn. It's, it's unbelievable. And his friend walks up to him and says, well, Harvey, what did you plant? Harvey says, well, I planted corn, but, but I didn't want corn. I wanted, I wanted cotton. What's all this corn doing here? His friend would say what? Harvey, I got a good doctor I want you to see. <laughs> if you didn't want corn, why did you plant corn? If you didn't want hay, why would you plant hay? If you didn't want to be talked about, why do you plant seeds of gossip? If you want favor, why don't you favor anybody and give them a break and patience and favor in life? Why do we plant things that we don't want to reap? Plant what you want to reap. Don't be shocked when a, when a bad harvest comes when that's what you planted, bad seed. I mean, if you want blessing, then sow blessing. If you want favor, sow favor. If you want generosity, sh sow generosity. If you want kindness, sh sow kindness in life. Plant what you want to harvest. Quit planting stuff you don't want to harvest because you're going to get it. You're going to harvest it. So plant the stuff you want to harvest. Here's the third thing. Plant based on how much you want to harvest. This is Jesus talking now in Luke chapter 6, verse 38. Listen to what he says. Very straightforward. Give. Did I, did I make it big? Yeah. I made it, the it big because I want you to notice it. Give and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over will be put into your bosom. For with the same measure that you use, it will be measured back to you. God, what Jesus is saying is, look, God doesn't determine how blessed you are. You determine how blessed you are. Because you determine how big an, a, a tool God uses to give you back blessings in life. God doesn't decide that, you decide that according to Luke 6, 38. So again, a farmer's standing out in his field and he says, man, there are only 10 stalks of corn out here. What in the world? I can't live off of 10 stalks of corn. Well, how much corn did you, how many seeds did you plant? Well, I planted 10. You really need to see this doctor, I'm serious. Why do we, why do we not understand if we only plant 10 seeds, we only get 10 stalks? I mean, you determine the harvest according to what Jesus said, by the measure that we give it out, it's going to be given back to us. So how generous are we with compliments? You, you like to be complimented, right? Well, how generous are you with compliments? How generous are you in forgiveness of other people? You love to be forgiven. You don't want people holding grudges against you, especially for no reason. Well, how, how much forgiveness do you give? How tolerant are you to other people? How patient are you with other people? When you go to the restaurant and you get waited on, what kind of tip do you leave? The context here is anything you give. Jesus says, give and it 
will be given. It means anything you give. So what is the condition here? That you give and it will come back. Let me show you how this thing works real quick and it's over. When you go to God, when you go to God, I'm reading what I wrote, so it'll be quick. When you go to God, you ask God for a blessing. God says, I love blessing. I'm in the blessing business. You prayed for a blessing, and I'm going to bless you. He then goes over and says, Angel, bring me Pastor Keith's measure, because I have this big old tub of blessing up here in heaven, and I want to give Pastor Keith some of it. According to your standard of measure, that's how I measure it back to you. I don't want the angel to walk over there and pick up a thimble <laughs> and say, here you go, God. This is his, what he gives. This is his measure. Well, I got a big old pot I can't give him but a thimble full. I want to give him everything because, man, I'm a great giving God. Giving is my business. A thimble, Really? All right, here you go. Ding. Wait, what? Whoa, whoa, whoa. Get, catch it. it hits. That's it? That's, that's a black. Well, I, I determined by how, what I measured my stuff out with is what he measures it back to me. You know what I want? I want whenever God says, hey, angel, bring me over Pastor Keith's ladle, would you? And the angel walks over there and he, he looks at it. And he grabs it and goes, ooh, 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 whoa. He has to get another angel to help him. Another angel or two to help him. So here it is. Give him that. That's his blessing right there. That's, what, that's the kind of ladle I want. Well, if I want that kind of ladle, that's the kind of ladle I got to give out with. I can't be stingy and chinchy and tight and hard and arrogant and mean and ugly and think that I'm not going to get that back. See, listen, guys, I'm telling you, this is the key to life here. In every area of your life, you want loyal employees, you be a loyal employee. You want honest people around you, you be honest. You want kind, gentle, great-natured, happy, wonderful, joyful people, then you be that. Because you reap, those are seeds that we sow in business, at school, at home with our family, wherever we are, at Goodwill or Family Dollar, where Walmart. It's hard to be that way at Walmart, but <laughs> you be that way. That'll, that'll increase your ladle. <laughs> that'll help you. See, I'm just telling you, uh, you don't have to be rich to, to get these blessings from the Lord because the Lord doesn't say, I'm going to, I'm going to uh, give these blessings to you according to how rich you are. He says, I'm going to give you these blessings according to how generous you are. That's determines what kind of blessing. So see, if you're poor, you can get so much better off in life. You don't have to be rich to receive generous blessings from God. You just have to be generous yourself. This, yeah, this is exactly right. And if you'll be generous with those seeds, listen to God's direction, you have a big ladle in heaven. Phenomenal. It doesn't matter what's happening in the economy of this country, which is probably going to get worse if every indication is. It doesn't matter. You're not getting it from the United States. This is from God. So it doesn't make any difference. And God's not limited by human beings. God does his work. It doesn't matter what... The, the federal treasury and the banks and blah, 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 and blah, blah, blah. I mean, he can bless you when everybody around you is cursed. He can bless you. He's able to do that. And he says, obey my truth. You're in the game. All right, let's bow our heads. 